Yep, we're recording. Great. All right. So, um, everybody, this is Steve McCord. I'm, uh, I think we can get started. We've got 33 people on right now, and people tend to trickle in uh, a little bit. I see a lot of familiar faces from the previous days and, and all that. Um, uh, so first I want to, my name is Stephen McCord, I'll be moderating today. Uh, this, uh, I got just a couple slides here I want to point out to folks. Um, the first thank all of our sponsors for this year. It's a different sort of event and as well for the sponsors. They get a little recognition this way, but, um, but not the in-person meet and greet and showing off their wares. So, um, you know, if you're interested in any of this sort of equipment or whatever, then um, and please visit their websites and thank them for being sponsors this year. And of course, thank myself too. I see me up there. And Valley Water, what Mark's going to be presenting. So uh, before we get started, let's see, there we go. Um, I want to point out today's agenda. So starting at noon and Mark will be talking until about one <clears throat> and then uh, from one to one thirty, it's a Q&A sort of time. So uh, during the presentation, everybody should be on mute and uh, but you can put questions in the uh, in comments and whatnot in the chat bar. And uh, at the end, we'll we'll uh, sift through those and, and ask uh, Mark and see him as well and ask ask and answer questions. And if you got any clarifying things or something else to add verbally, then you can unmute yourself and do it that way. Uh, the other thing today, it's a little bit different than earlier in the week. Today we have the annual business meetings from four to five thirty. But um, you can, it's the same link, the same uh, webinar service that'll be showing that. Um, so please join if you're interested in calms and taking a little more of a leadership role. It's a great group of people and uh, you can help set up the conference for next year and ideally that'll be in person. Um, and also looking a little further ahead to all the way to tomorrow, um, it's a different schedule. It's not the noontime thing, but it's most of the afternoon. So 2 to 2.45, we have the scholarship awardees. This was another record year. You can see we have six scholarship winners. And then uh, videos from uh, most of our sponsors for a little bit. Those are just quick little videos to tell what's going on. Then we have a subject area, subject matter experts panel. So it's um, not only the presenters from earlier in the week, but some other folks. So it's a mixture of folks uh, that couldn't present or just um, so there's a nice um, hour there for some great discussions. And feel free to you know bring your questions to that. And then at, uh, at the tail end of that, we'll have some closing remarks and then uh, trivia, which is, trust me, it's going to be a good one and a tough one. Uh, several people I know came up with some great questions and then a happy hour to finish off the day and the week. So um, thanks for making this uh, conference a success all week and, um, and dealing with the webinar sort of format we had to do. Um, so without any further ado, I want to get started. Uh, today's presenter is Mark Silos. Uh, just a quick bio on him. Um, he was a, a graduate of the, he's a banana slug. So the lower right here, University of California, Santa Cruz and a, a bachelor's in, uh, was it biological systems? Environmental geology, sorry, I was way off. And then uh, now he's a student at University of California, Merced uh, under um, the um, advisorship, so to speak of, um, of uh, Mark Butel, who's probably on here and probably some of his classmates also. Uh, also, Mark works at Valley Water, and he's a, a, a North American Lake Management Society uh, certified lake manager. Um, it's a program you should get involved with if you don't know what that's about, and if you're a lake manager. Um, and uh, the other thing that's really important to understand about Mark is um, this sort of thing. That's not actually Mark. That's a guy named uh, Alex Honold from Sacramento. He's, he, was, he was at a, the um, star of a recent documentary on him and free climbing this area. Mark's actually the one who took the photo. So he was held, doing this sort of thing and holding a camera. And uh, if you want to see what he looks like, uh, we might reveal that at the end. So just wanted to share that. So uh, without any further ado, let me turn it over to Mark. Or can you Take it. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, that looks about right. All right. Thanks for that intro, Stephen. You bet. And okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. Cool. So yeah, so um, I was planning on just talking about uh, the results of 
the hypolimnetic oxygenation studies that I've been conducting at Santa Clara Valley Water District for the last few years. Uh, but we actually have some new data that's hot off the Mercs, I guess, uh, for some of the dissertation work I've been doing at UC Merced, where we're trying to use solid phase amendments to reduce methylmercury in sediments. And so I'm going to talk first a little bit about a background of, of mercury. What is mercury? Why is it a problem in California? And I'll go over some common remediation methods. And then I'll talk about the study results from our 15-year oxygenation study at Valley Water. And then after that, I'll go over some recent experimental results for the manganese oxide and activated carbon study that we've been doing at UC Merced. So first of all, just a little background about mercury. Um, mercury, as you may know, is the only metal that's liquid at room temperature. Uh, gallium comes pretty close. If you put gallium in your hand, it'll melt. So people used to have this little lab joke where they'd make spoons out of it and then set it next to somebody's teacup and they'd start stirring their tea and it'd melt into their, their drink. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, mercury is actually the only metal that's, that's uh, a liquid at room temperature as opposed to body temperature. Uh, it's, it's gonna be abbreviated through most of this presentation as HG, which comes from hydrogerum, meaning liquid silver or water silver. And one of the important properties about mercury is that it forms an amalgam with most metals. And this made it really useful during the California gold rush because you could have mercury that was, or gold actually, that was in this, this placer or sediment deposit in little tiny bits. And then you could mix it with mercury and the mercury would bind all of the gold into this amalgam. And because mercury vaporizes at a lower temperature than gold, uh, workers could put this amalgam in these retorts and then they would heat it up and basically degas all of the, the mercury off and you're left with this gold nugget. So uh, this was obviously pre-OSHA, so definitely not, not very healthy for these people working there. Uh, there are tons of other uses for mercury, but I'm just going to go over my favorite one right now, which are these th thunderclapper pills. So these were made out of mercury chloride and it was seen in the early 1800s as this kind of like panacea cure-all for all sorts of diseases. But as you can see down here, it says a purgative of explosive power. So one of the things that was used for was a diuretic. And uh, during the Lewis and Clark expedition, they were eating mostly dried meat. And so you could imagine they'd get pretty backed up. And uh, so they were taking a lot of this, this mercury chloride. And there was a famous study that actually tracked where the Lewis and Clark expedition went from mercury deposits in latrines, which is, which is pretty funny and cool. So uh, there are a couple of different kinds of mercury. Uh, we have elemental mercury, which is the quicksilver I was talking about. Uh, so in elemental mercury, its outer valence electron shell is full. So it behaves kind of like a noble gas. It has a really low vapor pressure. And so it's volatile. And this also makes it easily transported throughout the atmosphere. So you might hear about the global mercury cycle, and that usually refers to elemental mercury reduced by stuff, things like volcanism or fossil fuel combustion. It can travel all throughout the atmosphere and then fall. It can either be deposited dry as elemental mercury or wet as uh, mercury two. And so we also have these inorganic mercury two compounds, which Typically speaking, they're more soluble and they're more readily absorbed by the body, but they can't cross your blood brain barrier. So they're not seen as to be quite as toxic as methylmercury. And so methylmercury is basically just uh, mercury two, um, but with a, a methyl group on it. And the problem with methylmercury is that it can um, bind with free cysteine in your body. And once it does that, then it looks structurally pretty similar to methionine which is an essential amino acid. And so you can see right here, um, this is methionine and this is a methylmercury cysteine complex. So these basically uh, can fool your blood brain barrier, which is a really selective membrane uh, in your body into thinking that it's an essential amino acid. And so it lets it into your brain and, it, and that's essentially why methylmercury is a neurotoxin. And so you've, you've probably seen a couple of these images before. So on the left, we have the Mad Hatter. Uh, so back in the hat making process in the, in the 1800s, they used mercury nitrate to convert the fur into felt. And so the, the phrase mad as a hatter comes from 
hat makers exposure to mercury nitrate. So that's an inorganic mercury compound. Um, if you've if you've seen the S Town podcast, John B. Macklemore, he was a antique horologist, which is basically a clock restorer, and he would use mercury amalgams to do something called fire gilding, where he would have something as an amalgam with mercury and then cover a certain clock component with it and then use a blowtorch basically to burn off the mercury and in inhale that. And I don't wanna give too many spoilers, but so the these two were, uh, were more of inorganic mercury poisoning. And when you see uh, methyl mercury poisoning, it usually comes from consumption of contaminated fish which bioaccumulate methyl mercury. And so this is an osprey. Uh, my colleague Jay Abel, who I work with, took this right outside of my workplace. And this is an osprey eating of bass. And then here on the right, there was this really devastating spill of methylmercury into a bay in Japan that caused really widespread uh, methylmercury poisoning. And so that's referred to as the Minamata disease. And we now have the Minamata Convention that's supposed to reduce global mercury cycling. Here we go. So uh, mercury was actually discovered and began to be mined in California several years before the gold rush. And I mentioned earlier that mercury is really important in the gold extraction process. And so the fact that we had this local source of mercury really served to make the gold rush must, much more productive because we didn't have to ship mercury from all over the world to extract the gold from the placer. And so on the left here, uh, this is a map. Uh, the gold are gold mines where there could be a mercury source in the form of elemental mercury from the extraction process. And then the red in the coast ranges, we have a lot of mercury mines, which are mostly associated with the Franciscan formation. And so, so we have you know, massive land disturbance in both areas and basically gold and mercury mines up and down the state of California. Uh, one study estimated that 10 million pounds of mercury was lost to the environment from placer mines alone during the California gold rush. And so this is really hard to conceptualize, but the gold extraction process was really inefficient. And so most of the mercury that was used actually ended up in our environment. So why is mercury a problem? Um, in aquatic systems, uh, mercury two compounds, those are those inorganic compounds I was talking about earlier, can be converted by bacteria into methylmercury, which for the rest of the presentation, I'll just abbreviate as MEHG. And methylmercury, like I mentioned earlier, is the kind of mercury that can bioaccumulate in aquatic food webs. And so on the right here, this is kind of a typical schematic of the bioaccumulation of mercury that happens in aquatic systems. So the biggest jump in methylmercury bioaccumulation is be between the water column and algae. It's like 100,000 times more in algae than in the water. And then each additional trophic step, you get more magnification until we have these high concentrations in these predator fish that people eat. And so really the, this methylmercury problem is an issue of people and wildlife eating contaminated fish. And people eat the fish, then we can get things like Minamata disease, you can have neurological defects, you can have respiratory problems. And so it is really a, it's a public health problem and it's a social justice problem because a lot of the time the people that are eating a lot of uh, mercury from contaminated reservoirs are lower income people that rely on it for subsistence. And so I'm gonna go over a couple different common ways that you can control the source of mercury uh, and control basically mercury pollution in reservoirs. So the first, which any study should begin with, is source control. And this is basically removing mercury from the environment to the extent possible. So if you have a mine site, you can do erosion control. Uh, if you have mine tailings, you can remove those or stabilize slopes so they don't run off into local waterways. You can cap contaminated sediment so far as you know that there's not gonna be new loading to replace the, the heavy concentrations on top. Uh, or you can reduce atmospheric emission by you know, burning less coal, burning less fossil fuels. Um, so this is a, a plot from a recent review article that was really good by Chris Eckley on uh, the current state of mercury remediation. And so these are all different contaminated sites on the x-axis. And these are fish tissue concentrations before and after 
free mediation actions on the y-axis. And so one thing that was really striking from this plot is that um, in sites one through seven, these sites only use source control. They didn't do any other sort of remediation actions. And you can see we've seen some pretty huge declines in fish tissue from source control alone. So we should definitely start with source control. Now, before I go into controlling the actual mercury methylation, which is kind of going to be what the bulk of this talk is going to be on, I'll just talk about methylation in general and how methylmercury is formed. So methylmercury formation kind of requires two main things. The first thing is a re are reducing conditions. Uh, so it's thought that sulfate reducing bacteria down here are the primary uh, bacteria that can produce methylmercury, but also some methanogens and iron reducing bacteria can produce methylmercury as well. And so um, theoretically, if we can raise the redox state of the system by either adding manganese, manganese oxides, nitrate, or oxygen, then we can basically poise the redox higher and thermodynamically favor bacteria that reduce manganese, nitrate, and, and, uh, and that use oxygen. And so kind of the whole, uh, the whole concept be behind redox control is adding one of these three compounds here to raise the redox state and inhibit that microbial methylation. Another thing that you need, which is somewhat related to redox actually, are mercury two species that can actually pass through a cell membrane. Um, so when you get sulfate reduction, you have sulfide produced that can actually bind up the methyl mercury, sorry, bind up the inorganic mercury, and in some cases prevent it from entering the, the cell wall. And so then it's not able to be methylated. Um, but yeah, the main thing, the main thing that we're going to be focusing on is the redox state here. And I'm going to refer, I'm going to kind of refer back to this several times throughout the presentation. So there have been a few experimental uh, field studies where people have tried to control mercury methylation by either reducing the availability of that inorganic mercury too, or by buffering the, the redox of the system to disfavor mercury methylation. And like I mentioned earlier, if you're gonna do redox buffering, then your options pretty much are oxygen, nitrate, or manganese oxide amendments. So this right here is a species cone to add oxygen. This was down at San Diego at Hodges Reservoir. Um, this is a different system than the ones we're gonna be talking about today, but same concept. Uh, we've also seen studies do nitrate addition. So this was at uh, Onondaga Lake in New York where they actually used, it was a really sophisticated method where they made this kind of like neutrally buoyant but heavy plume of nitrate that would stay at the bottom of the lake and the goal was to cover the sediment water interface with nitrate to try to inhibit methylation that way. Um, we've also seen activated carbon sediment amendments to try to sorb up that mercury too. Um, so USGS actually, I just got off a call right, right before this meeting. USGS is actually investigating using flocculants. So if there's a lot of mercury in the water column that's associated with sediment or with organic matter, potentially you could remove that and sink it to the bottom with flocculants as well. Okay, so we have our source control. We have our control of mercury methylation. Another way that we can uh, control potentially uh, mercury pollution in reservoirs is by controlling bioaccumulation. And there are a couple ways we can manipulate the food web in order to do this. These have not been implemented so much in a field scale and really all of these mercury methods that I'm talking about short of source control are, are to be considered pretty experimental. But there have been a few studies that have manipulated the food web in such a way to try to reduce methylmercury in top predators. So one of the things you can do is increase algae. And the, the logic behind this is given the same methylmercury production and concentration in the water column, if you have more algae, <clears throat> then it's basically spread out among more particles. And since zooplankton eat the same amount no matter what, that could actually reduce the methylmercury concentration of the zooplankton, which could cascade its way up the food web. Um, another thing that you could do is selectively stock prey fish to try to increase the growth rates of predatory fish. Um, so right here in this top plot here, in the y-axis, this is the change in mercury concentration. In the x-axis, this is the change in mass of the fish. And so what they saw is that with increasing growth, they saw their uh, mercury concentration in fish go down. 
finally, uh, you can try to control risk to humans by controlling methylmercury ex exposure. Uh, you might have heard about a recent assembly bill, uh, AB 762, passed last year. Um, and it basically requires uh, posting of site specific advisories at every uh, mercury contaminated reservoir where they exist. And the, the goal is to try to give people the information that they need so that they can reduce their consumption to a safe level. You've probably seen signage like this around reservoirs. But like I showed earlier, fish also eat the fish, or sorry, birds also eat the fish. And so unfortunately, uh, short of big bird, birds generally can't read signs. And so as an ecosystem tool, this isn't so helpful, um, but it's definitely important to try to reduce risk to humans. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over the results of our oxygenation study uh, in the Guadalupe River watershed in around San Jose. Uh, the results that I'm gonna present here are soon to be published in the journal Environmental Pollution. Uh, I worked on this with a, a many people over the years actually, um, but my co-authors are Mark Butel, who's my advisor at UC Merced, who kind of poached me over from Valley Water uh, so I could, I guess, learn to be a real scientist. <laughs> uh, Carrie Austin, who works at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board. Carrie's been working on mercury in the quad since I was in middle school, probably. And she's been a great mentor to me throughout my mercury career. Uh, Elizabeth Wilkinson, who I probably logged more boat hours with than anybody. Uh, probably on the planet, and who's responsible for collecting most of the data um, nowadays that you're going to see here. And then Clayton Leal, who's our fisheries biologist, who inspires me constantly to not only think about the water chemistry. And I think that that's something that we can all take away from this, because I, I feel like we're always so focused on the water chemistry that these food web issues kind of get ignored, when in reality they might be just as important or more important. Okay, so here are our study reservoirs. Um, ignore Lexington. So we're gonna be talking about Guadalupe Reservoir, Almaden Reservoir, and Calera Reservoir. So these three reservoirs are located adjacent to the former New Almaden Mining District, which is North America's largest uh, historic mercury mine. Most of these numbers here are mines or mine areas. This area is called Mine Hill, which was basically the site of most of the mercury mining. And I'm also gonna be talking about results from oxygenation study of another mercury impaired reservoir, Stevens Creek Reservoir, that's not affected by mine activity. So uh, the New Almaden Mining District, I mentioned earlier, uh, they started mining mercury shortly before the gold rush and it actually continued till 1975. Um, I really like this plot down here because it kind of shows the law of diminishing returns where on the X axis you have the year and on the y-axis, you have the amount of mercury produced in kilograms. And you can kind of see that in the beginning, uh, there was a lot of mercury produced, but there wasn't all that much ore treated. And then as time went on, there was a lot more ore treated, but with a lot less mercury produced. Now, in the 1930s, this was the, the Great Depression right here. And you can see that, uh, so this was actually when uh, Guadalupe Reservoir and a couple of our other reservoirs were built. And you can see that mercury mining actually continued after this period. So we still had continued mercury loaded into the reservoirs with, with existing mining. And we also had waste material that these reservoirs were built on top of. Um, there have been a lot of good source control projects that I'll talk about in a second, but the load to the San Francisco Bay remains large to this day. And most of that mercury load is assumed to be from the mining area and from legacy mining. So these are just a few of the projects that have been done across the years. Uh, mercury remediation started at the New Almaden mine area as early as the 80s. And uh, just recently, there was a project to remove roads that were paved by waste material. There have been some sediment and mining waste stabilization projects. There have been some creek remediation projects. And so, we started with this and it continues on to, to this day. But the reservoirs have contaminated mercury that is kind of like we were mentioning yesterday, if you tuned into the talk, um, either impractical, impossible, or unadvisable to remove. And so we kind of want to focus on controlling methylmercury production in the reservoirs. 
Um, but before we can do that, we kind of need to have a good conceptual understanding of methylmercury production. So these plots are both from Guadalupe Reservoir, which is sort of our most contaminated reservoir. On the left, this is in 2011, but this is kind of a typical pre-oxygenation season uh, of, of reservoir operations. So in February through about April, uh, the reservoir is totally mixed. It's at the same temperature all the way through. And then it's kind of starts to stratify where you get warm water on the top and cold water on the bottom. And it remains stratified until about November where it mixes again. And during that time, the stratification, oops, sorry. During that period of stratification, we have dissolved oxygen depletion in the bottom of the reservoir. And that coincided with this methylmercury production right at the sediment water interface. Um, you can see from this plot here, this on the top is oxidation reduction potential, which is a measure of how reducing or oxidizing a system is. And then in the middle, we have sulfate. In the bottom, we have methylmercury. Um, so these peaks in methylmercury occur at minima of sulfate under moderately reducing conditions. So we want to try to bring that redox back up to here so that we have these low methylmercury values. Um, so as you might expect in these contaminated reservoirs, we have really high mercury concentrations in fish. Um, on the left, you can kind of ignore this x-axis, which is about atmospheric deposition, and kind of just focus on uh, the y-axis, which are the 350 millimeter length standardized uh, mercury concentrations in bass. You can see these blue ones, most of them are our study reservoirs that I'm talking about today. And so even among mine contaminated reservoirs, uh, these are high outliers in the state. And if you look on the right here, uh, the mercury in bass between about 30 and 50 centimeters is like five to 10 ppm essentially. Um, and so that's kind of the size that people would eat. And a lot of people here, they hear these numbers like, you know, five, 10 ppm, and you don't really have a good conceptual basis for what that means in terms of risk. Um, but put, to put it simply, if I caught a 58 centimeter bass out of Guadalupe Reservoir, it'd probably have about eight milligrams per kilogram of, of methylmercury. And if I ate one eight ounce serving of that, that's the methylmercury equivalent of about 38 cans of tuna. And you might have heard, you know, pregnant women shouldn't eat any tuna and, you know, children should watch their fish intake because of mercury exposure. And so here in the Guad, we're really getting close to the, the realm of like acute mercury toxicity. And if people are subsisting off of this fish, it could create huge problems. So the systems that we've installed in these four reservoirs are called line diffuser hypolimnetic oxygenation systems. Uh, we have these oxygen generators on site that basically, they t it's, a, it's basically a hospital grade oxygen generator. And so it takes in air from the atmosphere and it compresses it. And then it sends it into these tanks that basically filter out the nitrogen and argon. And we send almost pure oxygen through these impermeable supply lines to these diffuser lines at the bottom of the reservoir. And these are like literally um, irrigation hose, like por porous hose that, has that have really small holes in them. And so these small bubbles diffuse out and dissolve into the bottom water. And you can kind of see that the diffuser line extends along kind of the deepest part of the reservoir, which is where most of the methylmercury is thought to be produced. Um, so, the conceptual basis of using these systems, I'm going to return to our redox ladder here. We want to take uh, redox away from sulfate reduction and bring it up to aerobic respiration um, because the sulfate reducers are, are thought to be the main methylators and we want to basically inhibit them so that we have aerobic respiration and, uh, and lower methylmercury production. And this is kind of demonstrated in this plot here where when we have zero oxygen in the hypolimnion, we have these high methylmercury concentrations, but basically anything above hypoxic and we meet our TMDL for the most part of 1.5 nanograms per liter. So here are some of the results. Uh, on the y-axis, this is dissolved oxygen saturation in bottom water. On the x-axis, state. And then here are four reservoirs that we oxygenate. 
these blue rectangles are, are when we actually oxygenated. And so you can see in Almaden Reservoir, Guadalupe Reservoir, Stevens Creek Reservoir, we were able to maintain bottom water oxygen concentrations above 100% for the entire period of oxygenation. And unfortunately, this wasn't the case in Calera Reservoir. Um, Calera Reservoir is a lot larger. It has a lot higher sediment surface area um, to the hypolimnion ratio. Uh, it has higher oxygen demand. And for a combination of these and maybe other reasons, um, it just wasn't very effective in Calera Reservoir. However, in the reservoirs where it was effective, we were uh, really pleased to learn that the effectiveness of the uh, HOS was not only limited to the area where we were oxygenating. And so this is a lateral profile. Here's the inlet of the reservoir. Here's the dam face. Um, the, the vertical lines are where we took sond profiles uh, one day uh, while we were stratified and oxygenating. And you can see that uh, here's, here's the diffuser line. You can see the whole hypolimnion is oxygenated above like 12 or 14 milligrams per liter. And so it, it, it was a really expansive effect. So here are some of the results. I'm gonna show two plots that look like this, but basically, um, the height of the bar reflects the mean concentration. Um, and each color bar reflects a different reservoir. The top row are results in the surface for the most part. Uh, the bottom row are results in the bottom of, of the water column. And uh, on the left, we have results. These are averages when the oxygenation system was off and on the right when it's on. And so you can see that we actually saw significant increases in bottom temperature and surface temperature temperatures while we were oxygenating. And some of these increases in bottom temperature were pretty extreme. Like you can see here in Guadalupe Reservoir, it's going from around 12 degrees to around, I don't know, 17 degrees Celsius. And that can kind of present a problem if you discharge from the bottom, which we do. And if the creeks that you're discharging into are Salmonid creeks, which ours are. Um, so these systems are really causing a lot of mixing down there, and that's increasing the temperature of the bottom water. Um, you know, as expected, we did see increased oxygen concentrations in the bottom water, surprisingly in the surface water too. Um, one of our most counterintuitive results that we got was related to redox potential, because when we're adding oxygen, we expect to increase the redox of the system because oxygen is our strongest oxidant on that redox ladder. However, what we saw uh, in the bottom water, we didn't really see any significant changes, but in surface water, we actually decreased the redox potential. And we think the reason why is because we're taking this reduced bottom water at the sediment water interface and we're bringing it and transporting it up to the surface. And that's giving the surface a lower redox potential. And so I think really this is more, if anything, evidence that there's mixing going on in the system. Uh, so here in this final row, this is chlorophyll and phycocyanin. Chlorophyll is the pigment in algae, phycocyanin is the uh, pigment in cyanobacteria. And we got significant increases in chlorophyll and phycocyanin in all of our reservoirs uh, during oxygenation. And this is related to the fact that we also got significant increases in nutrients in the surface waters. And so kind of Combining that with the temperature increases, we think that we kind of stimulated primary productivity. So here are our results of mercury in the water. Uh, kind of same setup. I'm gonna ignore total mercury right now because it's not so important to our purposes. Um, but in the bottom water, we saw these really, really dramatic decreases in methyl mercury concentration. So you could see in Guadalupe, we went from an average of like 12 nanograms per liter to around two nanograms per liter. And so that's a huge reduction, like 80%. Um, in the surface water, however, we didn't see any significant changes except for in Stevens Creek Reservoir where the concentrations actually went up. Uh, sulfate, which uh, is used by sulfate reducing bacteria, uh, which produce methylmercury, it increased significantly in both the bottom waters and the surface waters. And so you could kind of see this as two different things. 
One, if it increases relative to pre-oxygenation, it could mean that there's less sulfate reduction going on. But it could also mean that you're reducing, you're releasing sulfide from the sediments and oxidizing it to sulfate with oxygen. And so we think that this increased sulfate in the surface waters is probably more evidence that we're bringing bottom waters with sulfide up to the top and oxidizing that sulfide to sulfate. So we looked at whole lake methylmercury. And what that is, is basically we take methylmercury concentrations at five depths, and then we use the volume to depth relationship of the reservoir to calculate a whole mass of methylmercury. And that divided by the volume of the reservoir is kind of gives your average water column methylmercury. And we found that there was no significant difference in whole lake methylmercury compared to before oxygenation. Uh, except for in Stevens Creek Reservoir, where it increased. <clears throat> and so this kind of all points to the idea that we're not actually reducing the total methylmercury um, mass in the reservoir. We're actually just kind of moving it around and dispersing it from the bottom to the top. And so our, this is kind of our basic conceptual model that we have here. So these are all bottom release reservoirs. And since we know that methylmercury is produced mostly in the bottom waters, when we're bottom releasing, we're actually discharging a lot of our methylmercury throughout the season. So it's not really able to accumulate like it is in lakes, for example. Um, also by um, the oxygenation, turbulence from the oxygenation system, we're bringing nutrients up into the photic zone, we're causing warming, and that is actually causing algae blooms up here. Um, that sulfide is coming up from the bottom, it's being oxidized to sulfate. And so there's this kind of common uh, idea that kind of stems from algae blooms, which is that methylmercury accumulates in the bottom water of reservoirs during the season of stratification. And then when the reservoir mixes, then that's when it gets up into the photic zone and enters the food web. Um, but in these bottom release reservoirs, I really don't think that's the case, kind of for two reasons. The first being that you're discharging methylmercury throughout the season. And so you're actually not having the same level of accumulation as you would in a lake. And the second is just the timing of fall turnover. And so this is kind of the typical pattern that we see throughout the season of methylmercury concentrations in bottom water. And toward the end of the season, we actually have very, very reducing conditions that actually generally lead to more net demethylation of mercury. So when you, by the time you mix the reservoir around October, November, you actually already have low concentrations due to that demethylation. So combining that with the, the bottom discharge, we really don't think that turnover is what is driving bioaccumulation in these reservoirs. So we looked at fish tissue results before and after oxygenation and we didn't really see a, a difference. And a big reason for that is because we didn't really have a solid pre-oxygenation data set. And so this was basically an attempt to look at before and after uh, relationships, but you can see some of these data sets only have like 10 or 11 fish. And these were oftentimes collected in different seasons and they were different sizes. We had to try to like normalize them in kind of a uncommon way. And so, to really assess the effectiveness of the oxygenation system now, we kind of moved on to a different method where we were looking at the trend. And if you've ever uh, analyzed fish tissue mercury data, you know that it is pretty difficult because there are just so many factors that can confound your results. So mercury varies with fish species. You know, more predatory fish have, have higher mercury than less predatory fish. Um, larger fish have more mercury than smaller fish. Um, to make matters more complicated, the length to mercury relationship varies with species. And also the season that you collect the fish uh, can have an impact. Now, if we were able to go collect the same amount of fish in the same season and the same length all the time, then it wouldn't really be such a problem. But I remember I got an email from Carrie one time, Carrie Austin, and it said, you know, if you think you can go out and catch fish whenever you'd like, go ask a fisherman, something like to that effect. And so to really isolate the trend in mercury concentration over time, which is the metric that we're interested in, we applied this multiple regression model 
to remove the effects of all these confounding factors. And when we did that, we found that the date term was significant and negative in Guadalupe Reservoir and Stevens Creek Reservoir. And what this means is that there is a significant declining trend in mercury over time in these reservoirs. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, you didn't reduce the overall methyl mercury production apparently. Uh, methyl mercury in the photic zone remained the same or increased. So why do you have these lower fish tissue or these declining fish tissue concentrations in two-year reservoirs? Well, I mentioned earlier that we saw more algae in the photic zone. And so we think that some of that algae could have caused a bloom dilution effect where we reduced the mercury concentrations in fish through basically dilution, biodilution. Um, another thing is when you oxygenate a reservoir, you're opening up a lot of bottom water habitat to fish that did not exist before because before they wouldn't go there because there's no oxygen. And there are some studies um, like a Robin Stewart study at Camp Far West. And I think Colin Eagle Smith had a study that suggested the same thing that benthic feeding uh, fish often have lower mercury concentrations than pelagic feeding fish. So it's possible that our food web could have shifted to a more benthic. Um, we, we saw some really obvious uh, evidence that we saw mixing of profundal compounds into the photic zone. Um, and we saw temperature and turbidity increases. So that's something to consider if you're gonna install these systems. Um, we do have some potential other options. So there's, there are species cone systems which might cause less exchange between the bottom waters and the profundal zone. Uh, you might be able to alter the food web. Uh, like we have pretty good evidence right from this study that um, some trophic shift caused some de decline in methylmercury uh, concentrations in fish. So if you could do that in a careful manipulated way, that might be successful. And finally, you could maybe add sediment amendments, which don't cause mixing at all and have a really high contact uh, with the sediment surface area. And I feel like that is as good of a segue as any to go on to our study about sediment am amendments. And so this study is funded by the Department of Energy Minority Serving Institutions Partnership Program. It's a really great program that tries to give mentorship and research opportunities to universities that have a high percentage of minority students. Uh, one of which UC Merced is. Also wanted to give a shout out uh, to the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Lab, where we were able to do some fun experiments uh, to measure the fate, basically, of the manganese amendments that we applied. Uh, thanks to all the PIs, Peggy O'Day, Sam Trana, Mark Butel. We've had a ton of undergraduates working on this, and uh, so these are current undergrads, uh, but this is very much a team effort. So the conceptual basis uh, for manganese oxide as a mercury remediation method is kind of twofold. And this gives it some distinct benefits over things like oxygen or nitrate. In that it, it combines this redox buffering effect with sorption. Uh, that's kind of like the activated carbon effect I was talking about where you can remove the bioavailable inorganic mercury so it might not be so available for methylation. And so from a redox buffering perspective, we're trying to poise redox above sulfate reduction, but into this zone of manganese reduction as opposed to oxygen uh, of uh, aerobic respiration. And also manganese is known to sorb mercury and methylmercury um, due to its abundance of negatively charged surface sites. And so we could also be removing the, any methylmercury that is produced from the water column. So that could definitely be a, a benefit. So there's been uh, a, a fair amount of previous work on manganese. Manganese is considered of actually, well, really all of these uh, methods, but particularly manganese is considered a very uh, novel and experimental kind of work in progress. Um, it has not been applied on a field scale like the nitrate and the oxygen uh, treatments have. Um, there's been some research on manganese oxide as sorbent and manganese oxide as sediment remediation dating back to the eighties. But uh, more recently, we've had a pair of studies from some colleagues, uh, Dimitri Vlasopoulos and Alex Levin. Um, and it was kind of like a, a paired study where Dimitri did these incubations using sediment, uh, poor water, and also kind of these bigger mesocosms that were like fish tanks. And Dimitri was looking at the effect of manganese oxide amendments on poor water methylmercury. And Dimitri's study found that 
uh, manganese oxide amendments reduce methylmercury concentrations in sediment pore water, which conveniently is the name of the paper. Now, Alex's study, um, it took the manganese, it, or actually what well, took the sediments from these incubations, and he looked at it with um, different spectroscopic techniques to try to determine what the end form of the manganese was in the system. And Alex found that after 15 months of reaction, most of the manganese was actually being reduced to manganese 2 carbonate, which is considered to be a fairly stable form. And so it, it wouldn't be like reducing, just releasing dissolved manganese into the water column, for example. And so our study, we kind of took a deeper dive. Um, we looked at manganese am oxide amendments in a mine contaminated site, actually Guadalupe Reservoir. And we really wanted to know <clears throat> what was the mechanism of poor water methylmercury decrease that Dimitri observed? Um, was it from redox buffering? Was it from sorption? Was it a combination of both? We also looked at a lot of uh, different ancillary analytes to see what the effects of manganese ad addiction on water quality could be. And then like Alex's study, we looked at the fate of the manganese amendments in a reservoir system using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And we kind of did two experiments, but I'm gonna only explain one in the interest of time right now. Um, this was a relatively short-term experiment that lasted five days. Basically what we did was we got sediment from Guadalupe Reservoir. We mixed in either manganese oxide, activated carbon, or a combination of the, of the two. And then we incubated them at the bottom water temperature of Guadalupe Reservoir in the dark uh, for all of these different time steps in triplicate. And the star next to it, it um, that means that we spiked the sample with either 350 milligrams per liter of pore water sulfite or sulfate, uh, and then 50 milligrams per liter of acetate and pyruvate. And so what we were trying to do here was basically stimulate methylmercury production. And so after the incubation period, we spun them in a centrifuge, separated the pore water and sediment, filtered the pore water, and we did sediment and pore water analysis for a bunch of different compounds, including mercury and methylmercury. So here are some of our results. Um, this plot here uh, on the right, in the up above, these are pore water, filtered pore water. The bottom, it's sediment. And so each treatment is listed here. This is the unspiked control, spiked control, activated carbon, manganese oxide, and the mixture of the two. And you can see that, just like Dimitri's experiment showed, that uh, the manganese and the activated carbon amendments reduced poor water methylmercury concentrations um, compared to the spike control. Now in sediment, uh, it wasn't so much the same story. We did see these initial decreases in the activated carbon and manganese, but then we actually saw a lot of methylmercury production in both of those. And one thing you should kind of notice here that this, this methylmercury in sediments nanograms per grams, and in water it's nanograms per liter, so the sediment methylmercury is actually a thousand times what the water concentrations are. And so that can't be explained by sorption. Um, this is methylmercury production in the sediments. But the good thing is that it's remaining sorbed to the sediments where it's less likely to bioaccumulate. Another thing is up here, if you look at the total mercury, uh, manganese is a pretty strong oxidizer and we saw total mercury released up to about 100 nanograms per liter in pore water. In our longer term experiment, we saw it released from about 200 to 600 nanograms per liter, which is really high. And so you definitely have to be careful about oxidizing mercury uh, containing compounds and releasing mer uh, inorganic mercury into the water where it might become available for methylation later. So these are our ancillary parameters. Um, in the manganese and manganese activated carbon treatment groups, you can see that the ORP, the oxidation reduction potential down here did increase. So we were bringing the redox of the system up. Um, something interesting about the, the manganese was like I mentioned earlier, it was a, it's a pretty strong oxidizer. And we saw that the sulfate at the end of the experiment was actually higher than at the beginning of the experiment. And we think that that's from oxidation of like iron sulfide or other sulfide minerals. Um, kind of in the same vein as that, 
we saw in our manganese treatments that iron completely dropped out of solution. And so we think that what happened was the manganese four oxidized the iron two that was in solution, and then it precipitated as iron oxyhydroxides, which kind of dropped the in initial pH here. Um, and then kind of corresponding with this, as expected, we did see the release of dissolved manganese into the water, but really not in as high concentrations as you'd expect. This is 40 milligrams per liter, and we put five weight percent of manganese in. So most of the manganese is stain sorbed. So this is uh, x-ray absorption spectroscopy data, um, sort of in the weeds here, but basically um, you fit your spectra of your different sediment to a bunch of reference compounds, and you can kind of try to figure out what your sediment or kind of what manganese forms are in your sediment. And so this orange and this green kind of represent the actual manganese amendment. And this purple and this uh, blue sort of represent the, the sediment manganese that was already in there initially and aqueous manganese that's re released by the reduction. And kind of what we saw from these experiments is that the manganese four is being progressively reduced to manganese two but like I said earlier, it's largely remaining sorb, which is good if you're managing like a drinking water reservoir where manganese is probably more of a problem than mercury. Um, but nonetheless, we would vastly prefer that manganese to be precipitated into a solid form so that it doesn't cause problems itself. And this is a kind of a pH EH diagram, which on the X axis, it shows the pH and this is pretty much like the redox potential I was talking about earlier. And at the end of our five-day experiment, our pH and EH were right here at the star. And that's sort of right on the edge of the stability field of manganese 2 plus um, our dissolved manganese species. And so kind of the next idea is if we can just slightly raise the pH to above 8, then we could actually thermodynamically favor the precipitation of these manganese minerals, which would be a much better end product than this manganese two. So the next steps in this experiment, uh, basically we want to synthesize a manganese oxide modif modified activated carbon where we basically have manganese oxide on the surface of activated carbon to increase the sorption and also to slow the kinetics so we don't just like blow through our amendments so quickly because we, we don't want to have to be applying this amendment all the time. We also want to investigate co-amendment with calcium carbonate to increase the pH and bring uh, that's, that uh, manganese into the solid phase. And next, we're also going to conduct flow through experiments to try to test the effectiveness of uh, manganese in fluvial and shallow groundwater systems. And so, at the end of this presentation, you kind of might be thinking, uh, which experimental redox treatment is right for my reservoir? And the answer is they're all experimental. And so none of these are really like uh, proven fixes, just like how Eli was saying the other day that no one system will probably solve your algae problem. It's likely that no one system will probably solve your mercury uh, problem. And, but there are like some, some distinct uh, pros and cons of all these different systems. So oxygen, it's for some reason not seen as a chemical. And so it's kind of seen as benign. Um, so it's, it's really easy to get permitted. Uh, it has the potential for multiple benefits like harmful algal blooms, which wasn't the case in our study, obviously. Fish habitat, drinking water quality, and maybe even greenhouse gas emissions if methane's a problem in your reservoir. But we also have some preliminary data that shows that that's probably not the case. Um, the cons are it's really high maintenance and inefficient. Uh, they're always shutting down, especially in hot environments where the power isn't very consistent. They're energy intensive, they cause mixing, and they can increase temperature and turbidity. Like we saw in Calero, it, it might not increase DO in all the reservoirs. And I think there was a question the other day about oxygenating Clear Lake. I mean, certain lakes will just be too big to oxygenate. Um, so nitrate. Uh, the pro that I can think of is, is it's appropriate for incidental application and in receiving water bodies that are already getting high nitrate water. So Mark Butel has had a study in, a, I think it was a Virginia reservoir where they looked at the effects of wastewater discharge into the reservoir and saw that they actually reduced methylmercury. 
Um, but you know, us as lake managers, the thought of adding nitrate to a reservoir is a little scary because it can cause algae blooms, especially if it's an N-limited system like Byron was kind of alluding to the other day. Also, this would not work well with, bo with bottom release uh, discharge because you'd basically be discharging all of your amendment that you're putting in. And so it'd kind of be a waste. And manganese oxides, like I mentioned earlier, they have a really high sediment contact. So they're efficient. They combine sorption and redox buffering. Uh, if we can slow the kinetics, then you could possibly get away with less frequent application than the other methods. And it doesn't cause mixing. And one of the great things about manganese, it's, it's kind of a new frontier. It is a novel treatment. And so that means that there's a lot of room for optimization of this method. And that's exactly what we're looking at. Um, some of the problems that we saw initially were you can have oxidation of, of uh, compounds, including mercury containing compounds that could um, re basically oxidize sulfide into sulfate and potentially cause methyl mercury production. Uh, we saw that we did have methyl mercury production in the sediments in the manganese oxide treatment, even though it wasn't re released into the pore water. And if, if your reservoir is a drinking water reservoir and the pH is low, you could release dissolved manganese into the, into the water, which would obviously complicate drinking water treatment. Um, so with that, I can take some questions. Thanks to all my co-authors. Thanks to our funders, NOMS, COMS. Yeah. Great. A round of applause for Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, we did get a bunch of questions. I was actually uh, make, uh, noting myself a few questions uh, in case there weren't any, but there's a there's a long list of them. So for, for everyone else, um, uh, you know, that's the, the end of this presentation. We can take up to about half an hour to, to go through these questions and others that may come to you. So I can see there's uh, a host of them. So uh, we'll start from the top. Uh, you can see them as well, right, Mark? See this? Um, yes, I can. Okay, there's a, I see a, there's a couple or three in there from Alex Warren. He got in first, so we'll start with that. Uh, uh, question was, would a, would a species cone with a high oxygen supply but no vertical mixing be su superior, especially for Calero? In other words, is, the, is it the, um, the vertical mixing that's causing the problem? That was one of the hypotheses you had. I, I would argue yes. Um, I think that a species cone, there's reason to believe a species cone would be a better treatment. Um, we're going to get a lot of good data on that really soon, but we don't really have any yet. And so I'm going to be following studies like uh, the Hodges study, um, like the San Pablo study, and uh, be looking out for that in the future. Well, they've got some. Good. And uh, how McLean asked, um, <clears throat> were, were the thermoclines maintained with the, oxygen, with the HOS systems? Uh, yeah, they were. You can have some slight erosion of the bottom of the thermocline where it basically shrinks. Um, but yeah, they are not mixing the reservoir like totally, but you are causing some exchange of water. Yeah. And what you, what you point out is the, the bubbles do rise very, very slowly and they do carry one some water with them. So that's the water that gets into the surface, even though it's not enough energy to destratify it. Yeah. Um, uh, Scott McReynolds from DWR had a question. Is, uh, was there uh, any increase in cyanohab, so uh, cyanobacteria and harmful algal blooms? Uh, we haven't those? been looking at like taxonomy or toxins so much, but we have been monitoring phycocyanin and phycocyanin did go up in all four reservoirs. Um, so I am not 100% sure with cyanohabs, but I think there's reason to believe that it might. And uh, next question from Michael Cox. Uh, can you comment on why almadin mercury and fish average is lower than Guadalupe, yet almadin had higher amounts of um, ore roasting waste? Um, okay, so first answer to the question is I don't believe it actually is. Uh, I think that the data that exists are very, very small young of the year fish, and we don't really have enough information to say if it's actually lower in terms of like the big adult fish. Um, but I think that Al like if it is, Almaden Lake is super eutrophic, like way higher algae than uh, those other reservoirs that you mentioned. And so I think you could be seeing a bloom dilution effect there. Got it. And overall different, um, different ecology. Yeah. Um, Hal again, uh, this guy's full of questions. Um, is there a specific place to test the fish? Is it a fillets or edge of, edge of fillets? What did you, what did you do for these, for the study? So the standard uh, is whole fish for small fish and fillet for large fish. 
that people eat. And that kind of makes sense from a regulatory perspective because people don't eat the bones, right? But fish do, or, or sorry, uh, other fish birds do, and birds do and whatever. Fish consumers. Yeah. yeah. And so, but the more I study mercury and the more I do food web studies, I think it's actually way more appropriate to only, only measure tissue mercury in all fish. Um, you introduce a lot, because of how the homogenization works and because of how small of an aliquot of the fish you actually analyze when you run the mercury, you can in introduce a lot of variability just by the homogenization. And so I think that it's way more appropriate to only use tissue yeah. on all yeah. fish. Even the smaller ones. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Michael Cox had another question. What's the effect, effect of the amount of water stored, so the reservoir level on the redox potential? Um, so a the, the amount of water level fluctuation has a huge effect because when, if the water level goes down, then you have all those reduced compounds in the sediment that are exposed to the oxygen in the atmosphere, and then those get oxidized. And then when it goes back up, then you have all this crazy uh, reduction of sulfate and, and other things, uh, carbon, whatever. Um, and so I'd say the water level fluctuation has a huge, uh, has a huge effect. In terms of like, if, if there's a really low amount of water in the reservoir, then it actually might not be like as anoxic, I guess, because, um, you know, you can have more penetration and it can be mixed by, uh, by wind easier. And so it's possible if it's like really low water level, then the redox could be higher. Yeah. So, and uh, I'll ask a, one of my questions is related to that one with, um, there was a uh, comparing on and off uh, concentrations. Uh, would some of that just be seasonal? Like if it was not on and off, but just, uh, you know, stratified, unstratified season? Because the, the HOS was operated only in the stratified season, right? Yeah. So we actually, I didn't mention this, but because I didn't want to like make things too confusing, but we actually only considered pre-oxygenation data during the season that the oxygenation system would have been stratified. So okay. it was only from like May to October. Great. Yeah. Uh, Joe Sullivan, uh, got a question. Um, bass prey are largely on crayfish, which can also have high mercury concentrations. Uh, do you think that could have played a part, I guess, is the other part of the question? Uh, we find that crayfish have pretty low mercury, con methyl mercury concentration generally. Um, but yeah, definitely like, uh, if the fish are feeding benthic versus pelagic, it can definitely have a huge effect. Um, we did some gut content analysis recently of big bass and they pretty much had everything in there. Frogs, huge fishing hooks, uh, a lot of small bass, actually, they're like very cannibalistic. Um, but yeah, um, I think, yeah, if, if the bass are eating like predominantly crayfish in one reservoir versus like predominantly other fish in, in another, I think that could have a huge effect. Yeah. Yeah. It's some growth, some, some part of the growth cycle, they change from eating other little things to bigger fish. Yeah. Um, Maya Singer had a question uh, based on these results. What do you think the next steps for controls in the reservoirs are continue with the line diffusers or look for other and look for other long term, you know, the long-term trends or consider other problems and, and other approaches. Yeah, so we're sort of like doubly on the hook to continue line diffuser systems uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, but one of the changes that we will be making in the future sometime is uh, we have a couple of seismic retrofit projects going on um, in the coming many years. And during these retrofit projects, we're gonna be draining the reservoirs entirely and rebuilding the dams to meet uh, DSOD regulations. And one of these reservoirs is Calero Reservoir, and that's the one where the oxygenation system really isn't working. And we were considering replacing that with a space cone system. And so by the time that project happens, we'll probably have a lot of good information based on your studies and based on the San Diego studies. Um, and we'll, have, we'll be able to make a more informed decision. Um, but yeah, like we don't really necessarily have any plans to do something like food web manipulation or like solid phase amendment quite yet. Um, we will attempt to replace our treatment systems with better technologies as they come up, as long as we feel like they're safe. Um, but right now we want to help with data gathering uh, as much as possible. And we want to evaluate 
um, like do food web studies and and support studies like we've been doing at UC Merced and with UC Davis to try to build our, our information. Yeah, great. Let me, um, let me, Michael Cox, full of questions. <laughs> I'm gonna skip him and Alex for a second, get some others in here, and then we could come back to those with time. Uh, Brian, uh, Byron had a question, I think. No, it wasn't a question. It was just a comment. Great presentation. Um, and the overview of the uh, redox and uh, uh, mercury treatment strategies is super helpful and balanced view. So it, that's just a kudos. Uh, Svetla Todorova had a question. Um, nitrate addition hasn't been resulting in algal blooms. I, um, if, if I recall, Svetla is at um, uh, Syracuse University. So she was part of that work in, um, uh, was it Onondaga Lake, I believe? Um, yeah, there you go. It's in there. Uh, they were shut. They shut down uh, phosphorus release and decreased eutrophication. So the the notion, it, understandable, that um, adding nitrate would increase um, algal production. They didn't see that in that case where they were they were trying it. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really famous and really well done study. Um, and so I showed that redox ladder. I mean, this isn't for Slat Law, obviously, but for for everyone else. Um, I showed that redox ladder earlier and below denitrification and manganese reduction, you had iron reduction. And so phosphate is thought to be bound with like iron minerals and it can be released into the water column right. um, at low redox. And so if you add nitrate, you could actually inhibit the release of phosphate as well as uh, methyl mercury. And so, yeah, it's really great to hear that that worked really well in the Onondaga system um, and I think, yeah, it's definitely a doable treatment, but it requires very careful planning and careful application to make sure that it doesn't rise up to the photic zone. I also think since Onondaga isn't bottom release, it's, it's more appropriate in, in that system. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's good to note that they had really great success. And actually, I think they have declining fish tissue mercury in Onondaga now. Let's see, Alex uh, added some to that. Okay, we can go back. That was uh, the last uh, part there of the questions. Go back to um, a question from Michael Cox. Has anyone installed piezometers and monitored saturated shallow soils at the reservoir for level, as reservoir level fluctuates? Um, we have not done that. I guess actually, when you think about it, that's kind of how a reservoir gauge works, right? Um, but yeah, no, we're not really looking. I think what Mike, is getting at is some sort of Vados connection between the mine area and the reservoir. And we haven't been looking at that. I think it's an interesting idea for sure, especially because we have recent evidence as was pointed, about, pointed out by Mike that we have some pipes coming into the reservoir that we didn't even really know about um, from the mine area um, that had really low flow, but pretty high concentrations of, of methylmercury, if I recall. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's good to look at the whole system and not just the reservoir. I think we have the benefit though in these reservoirs of not having summer inflow. So we can kind of negate uh, summer inflow in, in our methyl mercury budget when evaluating the, the treatment system effectiveness. Yep, great. And uh, I'll, I'll follow on with that one then come back to Alex. Um, Michael had another question, uh, coast rain silica carbonate, mercury mines and co-located reservoirs can have carbonate springs and iron rich clay accumulations due to accelerated weathering of the um, silica carbonate as well as slightly acidic mine drainage. Uh, rock soil has significant iron and manganese minerals. So have those been considered in the studies? Yeah, I mean, I wish we had more carbonate loading into the reservoirs because then manganese would probably work better. Um, so if you're talking about manganese and iron, in entering in the reservoir uh, that would have some sort of like biogeochemical effect in buffering the redox naturally. Um, I haven't really thought of that, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, a couple things from Alex. Uh, in Newman Lake, Oregon, uh, Barry Moore and students have been using a species cone combined with alum. Uh, and he says, I see no reason to combine such a cone with manganese additions for a belt and braces approach. I'm not sure what that means to methylmercury reduction. Got it. Um, so so you're, you're talking about how 
it was to control algae. So they combined alum as a flock and with oxygenation to prevent continued release from the sediments. Was that the idea? I believe so. Maybe you okay. could. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I have wondered about what is the fate of the flock. People would know better than me for sure. And actually, uh, one of the studies that that, uh, that Peggy O'Day's lab is working on at UC Merced right now is looking at these flocks from these USGS mercury experiments to see how locked up the mercury is in the flock. Um, and so I've always kind of wondered that same thing about nu nutrients. Like, it, does it actually stay there forever? Uh, is it available for re-release? If it is available for re-release, I think it'd be smart to do both because then you're taking out what's there and you're preventing it from being re-released into the water column, theoretically. Right, right. And uh, there's another one later from Alex, I believe. Nitrate addition has its benefits, but in, but, Okay, I guess this is going back to the nitrate addition part, um, but in warmer climates where where denitrification removes most nitrogen, nitrate additions are problematic for harmful algal blooms and applies the ocean domoic acid problems. So different chemicals in different climates is a point. So uh, Onondaga is in the up, upstate New York, I believe, whereas warmer climates might be a different situation. Um, somebody else asked about the, the presentation, if the slides would be available, and I believe the answer is yes, they'll be on the Calms website. Yeah, Sam? they'll be, so we're going to have a recording on the actual website. If you want the slides, hit me up for them. It does have some unpublished uh, plots in there that I'd ask you to please not share or post, um, yeah. but yeah, I can share them. All right. yeah, feel free to shoot me an email. There you go. Yeah, and you see it there, MC Los. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it. I didn't. I didn't notice any other questions. Uh, if there is, uh, somebody could unmute themselves and ask it. Um, let's see. Uh, I I had one other question with um, uh, back to the um, the H, the uh, line diffuser system and the effects that that has. I was wondering if the physical mixing, so we were talking about how the, it's a uh, very slow movement of these very small bubbles, but nonetheless, it creates a bit of a plume and, and affects the thermocline and carries some nutrients and, and methylmercury from the hypolimnion into the epilimnion. I wonder also if uh, there could be like the, whatever methylmercury is still produced it, or appears to be produced in the hypolimnion is actually produced in the sediments. But because you know the sediment's still being anoxic, now you have a little more physical mixing. So you've reduced the boundary layer and it increases the flux of that. Yeah, this is totally, I think, very likely. Um, so Mark Butel has a couple papers on a concept called uh, induced oxygen demand, yep. which is where basically turbulence at the sediment water interface and higher oxygen concentration uh, leads to more diffusive flux of, or it basically leads to more oxygen demand uh, from the sediments. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, I definitely think we're liberating stuff from the sediment that would not have come out of the sediment before. Mm -hmm. So as well as a, let that let that dog lie. Yeah, I think. This, can you hear? This is Alex. I think yep. one of the things here is that the the, the uh, oxygen bubble diffusers were really designed for deep water, and the use efficiency when you go to ones as shallow as Calero, um, it's still fine because the cost is lower of oxygen. So if you have deeper reservoirs with mercury problems you're going to have less mixing. It's just the bubbles, you know, as the bubble, an oxygen bubble comes up, it takes in nitrogen as it loses oxygen. But given a deep enough water, it really starts to, to, to go away. So in somewhere even like Upper, upper San Leandro, I'd expect you got, we would get less transfer because we've got much less algae using the bubble diffusers than we have uh, had before. So I think that, that may be just the fact that these mine reservoirs are fairly shallow. And that might be sort of an artifact for the mixing part, which would help, of course, in other reservoirs, which were deeper. Definitely. Yeah, yeah good point. Yeah, the... so, yeah. As, as I say, it gets back to your point, Mark, about um, 
you know, there's no uh, silver bullet and different systems for different reasons, different things will work. And even within the same type of thing in different, different reservoirs, it won't work as well. Definitely. Okay, um, I'm not seeing other questions. A couple other comments saying great presentation. Uh, it's super clear and interesting, uh, interesting research and look forward to hearing more about it. Um, so if there's nothing else, we can we can sign off. Uh, today's a little bit different. As I was saying, we've got the business meeting at four o'clock. So please uh, log into the same system at four to 5.30. Um, you can have a cocktail, it's okay. And, um, and enjoy that. That's uh, when we elect officers for the next year, uh, talk over the experience of this conference, in case we gotta do it like this again and, and look forward to planning for next year. So uh, please join. All right. Um, so with that, if there's nothing else, thanks again for all the questions and everybody joining. We had 50, 60 maybe people at one time and uh, look forward to seeing you guys again later. Thanks again, Mark. Well, thanks everyone.